So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Jesse Olbert, who's a graduate student in ancient history and Mediterranean archaeology. Yeah. And uh, I had the uh, experience of working with him on this project in the Hearst Museum recently, where we um, were going to hear about how we analyzed the ancient helmet. And it's an interesting challenge with these additive materials like metals and ceramics to, to use XRF to decipher a little bit about the recipes that were used in these, um, in these materials, um, which is a pretty different from what, I use, what I'm experienced uh, with in using it on lithics, which is, of course, subtractive. We don't have an issue with mixing different types of sources. So I'm uh, so interested to hear what you found from our, from our work. Thanks for joining us. Yes, cool. All right. This is my first time wearing a wire, so that's going to be a little wonky. But uh, <coughs> thank you, everyone. I'm fighting a cold right now, so bear with me if I need to take sips of water and things like that. Um, all right. This summer, I was lucky to study an ancient Greek bronze helmet at the Hearst Museum. The primary members of the team were myself, Jared Delaney, uh, and Nico Tripsevich. Uh, using a portable X-ray fluorescence, or PXRF, spectrometer, we measured the chemical composition of the helmet at the Hearst. The study produced several interesting conclusion, conclusions about the helmet's production history and the metallurgical practices of ancient Greece. PXRF, PXRF technology has been around for some time, uh, and archaeologists have been using PXRF spectrometers on archaeological sites and archaeological material all over the world. Uh, as usual, classical archaeologists have been a little late to the draw, <laughs> and as far as I'm aware, this is the first study to use a PXRF device on Greek armor from the Iron Age. So we approach this project with uh, many questions and few expectations. In this presentation, I will introduce you to the object, briefly explain the science behind our study, present our results, and show how this changes our understanding of ancient Greek metalsmithing and military technolo uh, technology. So without further delay, here's the helmet, uh, object 8-4597 at the Hearst Museum. It is 22 centimeters tall, 24.1 centimeters long, and 17.5 centimeters wide. The thickness of the metal is uh, 1.5 millimeters, and that's uh, kind of an average because it's not consistent at all. Uh, stylistically, it looks a lot like the Corinthian typology of Greek helmet, and, uh, which is the most uh, popular type of Greek helmet in the classical period, but it retains several unique and unexpected features. I use the term proto-Corinthian in my title, and I'll explain exactly what that means later in the presentation. Roughly equidistant holes run all along the bottom edges of the helmet, which you can see pretty well in this slide. Yeah, that works, okay. Uh, <laughs> these must have been uh, accommodations for an internal padding. The object was constructed in two pieces which are held together with a series of rivets. Most of the rivets are now lost, uh, but there are, we still have a couple. Uh, there are long fractures running above the middle of the left and right eyes. Over the left eye, there uh, are the partial remains of a rectangular patch riveted over the fracture with four rivets. Only half of the patch and two of the four rivets remain in situ. And uh, I guess you can't really see it in this slide, but it's way up here. We'll get a better image of it later. On either side of the seam, between the two halves, there are slightly uh, uh, circular-ish uh, equidistant holes, uh, which you can, those little white dots, and then there are remains of others. Uh, in conjunction with a small loop at the back of the helmet, these holes probably facilitated the attachment of a horsehair crest or some other uh, decorative extension. It has a uh, flattened neck around the back side of the helmet, uh, it does not have ear holes, and it has this, uh, squared cheek guards, which are not detachable. Um, this last observation may seem self-evident, but it's actually a really important stylistic determiner. As uh, you can see in this slide, the helmet is dented and damaged. Uh, on, on the right side of the helmet, there are, are two long horizontal dents and several circular dents. Um, this is one of those circular dents, and then, of course, the big, the big one. Uh, Carolyn Weiss, who originally published this helmet in 1977, argued that the dents were created by an axe, uh, uh, the long dents were created by an axe, and the circular dents were created by sling bullets. Other scholars have gone a step further and even suggested that these blows uh, are what killed the original owner of the helmet. I remain unconvinced, of course, but our understanding of ancient Greek warfare has actually changed a lot since 1977. These objects were probably pretty expensive and only reserved for an aristocratic minority. The material itself might not have actually provided much in the way of a physical defense. Uh, as all the weapons in this period were constructed from iron, a significantly harder metal than bronze. So we might be better served thinking of this helmet as an object of display rather than a physical military tool. Uh, 
The PXRF spectrometer that we used in this study was a Tracer 3SD, pictured here on the left, being, and you being used by Nico on the right. The spectrometer is just a handheld version of the much larger and immobile XRF machine. It is a non-destructive but less accurate method of, to measure the elemental composition of an archaeological uh, object. <coughs> the device emits a highly charged photon into the object. We determine the energy and size of this pho photon beforehand. The photons emitted by the PXRF spectrometer enter one of the atoms in the object and collide with one of its electrons, usually within the electron, uh, electron ring closest to the nucleus. So you can see that here on the left. When an electron is knocked out of its ring, the magnetic field within the atom gets all wonky and, all the, uh, and an electron jumps from an outer layer down into the lower ring. Uh, electrons in this lower ring require less energy than the outer electrons, and the excess energy is released uh, during this process in the form of a photon, to, uh, and the atom stabilizes, which you can see on the, this last image. The spectrometer then measures this, me this released energy. So we're just measuring that little yellow line. <laughs> Most atoms have three rings of electrons. Let's see. Uh, and these rings are called the KL and M series, moving from the inside the ring to the outside, the outside ring. When electrons from the next highest ring jump into the K series, uh, it, they release what we call a K-alpha photon. When they jump from the outside ring, we call it a K-beta photon. On average, an atom will produce one K-beta photon for every six K-alpha photons. Sometimes we hit the electrons in the L series of an atom rather than the K series. Atoms behave a little bit more chaotically when we knock, them, uh, when we knock out one of the L series electrons, but this process is still predictable and trackable. Ideally, we'd like to fluoresce uh, the electrons in the K series because they are the easiest to measure by far. Uh, in theory, the energies of every photon in this process is unique to each element in our sample. Uh, the frequency of a particular energy signature will therefore tell us the density of each element. Of course, nothing in nature is ever uniform, and there are thousands of variables that might throw this process out of whack. But in theory, this is, a, this is supposed to be how it works. As I mentioned earlier, whenever you use one of these uh, PXRF spectrometers, you have to pre-program the energy of the photon and aim it at a specific group of elements. Bronze is usually composed of nine parts copper and one part tin. Uh, copper is Cu29, and tin is uh, 50. Um, so these elements were the primary targets of our study. Uh, we set the device to emit 40 kilovolts of energy at 12 microamps through Bruker's yellow filter. In other words, we limited ourselves to fluorescing elements between chromium and antimony in the K-series. Uh, so chromium is here, 24, and antimony is there. So everything in between these <coughs> for the K-series. Uh, and anything heavier than presidium, which is uh, right there, 59, so everything heavier than that in the L series. Another way to think about this is that we could only read, thing, only read energies uh, between 5 and 30. So if you can't really see it in the slide uh, because of the, it's a little fuzzy, but 5 energy for the K series is right there, uh, and 30 is right there. So it, we can only read things in that, in that range. Uh, sorry, it looks, it looks better on my, <laughs> on my computer. <laughs> All right. Uh, once we get the results, they come to us like this, like a, as a spectrum. Uh, we have to manually identify every element in our sample. The biggest peak in this slide represents the K alpha of copper, uh, and the, little or the smaller peak is the K beta. So this, this one, which is unlabeled, the K betas are not labeled. Um, sorry, lost my place. As you notice, the labels for lead and arsenic, uh, PB and AS, are overlapping right here. These are blown up versions of the same test uh, shown in the previous slide. Unfortunately, the K alpha of arsenic and the L alpha of lead are only different by 0.01 kilovolts. Uh, luckily, the K beta peak of arsenic, which this blue line represents, shows us where it should be, this beta peak, um, does not overlap with any other element, so arsenic is still detectable and relatively distinguishable based on the K-beta peak. Uh, this is just one example of the potential difficulties of this kind of study. Luckily, there were only trace quantities of arsenic in all of our samples, whereas there was always a substantial amount of lead. This spectrum was actually our first shot on the helmet. Uh, we shot a total of 30 points for a length of three minutes at each point. There are 11 points on each side of the helmet, three on the rivets holding the two halves together, three on the patch, and two on the patch's rivets. 
The resulting spectra were studied individually and as groups corresponding to their location on the helmet. The sampling process was conducted in a closed museum space over the course of a single day, and we used two methods to interpret the resulting spectra. <coughs> the first method is, in my opinion, the least valuable because it is the most deceiving. I was provided with an algorithm from Bruker, the manufacturer of the spectrometer, that calculates the chemical compositions of each spectrum. The algorithm addresses interelemental interaction, uh, distinguishes overlapping elements, and compensates for numerous other variables that might skew the results. It is the most accurate methodology for measuring chemical composition, but only when you already know exactly which elements are in your sample. If the algorithm compensates for elemental interactions that do not actually exist in your sample, then your results will be skewed and inaccurate. This, of course, creates a paradox because you can't build an algorithm until you know how much of each element is in your sample, and you can't calculate an accurate elemental composition until you have an algorithm. The algorithm that Bruker sent me was their general catch-all algorithm for archaeological bronze objects. And actually, after doing some research, I think it was uh, an algorithm that they invented for bronze cannons that they uh, took out of the Caribbean. Uh, so the algorithm assumes that there was magnesium, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, arsenic, lead, tin, and antimony. So those are all those up there. In reality, we did not detect any magnesium, cobalt, or antimony, and only trace amounts of nickel, zinc, and arsenic. We know for certain that the algorithm was not working properly because it produced negative percentages for some of the elements that were not actually present. Consequently, the result from the Bruker's algorithm, need, uh, the results need to be treated qualitatively rather than quantitatively as a guideline rather than a conclusion. But luckily, as a guideline, they're actually really reassuring. Excuse me. The primary interpretive methodology that we used to understand our data was to calculate and compare total photon counts. Using the RTAC software, which is a more general XRF program, we identified each element in our 30 spectra. Based on the elements we identify, RTAC cancels out all the background noise and produces uh, total photon counts for each element. On their own, these photon counts uh, don't really tell us much. There's just way too many background variables. Um, for example, this method can't accommodate inter-elemental interaction or overlapping elements. Uh, so it cannot be used to calculate a percentage of each element in the sample. The value of a total photon count is that it allows us to create com uh, comparable ratios between two or more elements. The relationships between the elements in one part of the object can be compared to other parts of the object in order to learn a uh, relative chemical com composition of each of the object's parts. Like the good scientists that we are, <laughs> we approach this experiment with several questions. Is the helmet authentic? Was it ever chemically treated? Uh, when was the patch added? How was the helmet constructed? And when was it constructed? The first and arguably most important question we had to tackle was whether Object 8-4597 was even an authentic archaeological artifact. It was purchased somewhere in France or Italy in 1900 by A. Emerson on behalf of Phoebe Hearst. It subsequently entered the Hearst collection without a known provenance. The absence of any metal, uh, metallic impurities and a relatively consistent makeup would have suggested that the object was constructed by a 19th century forge uh, using uh, industrially, re industrially refined metal alloys. But the helmet actually had a relatively diverse range of chemical inclusions. The inconsistency of the metal suggests that the helmet was constructed using ancient metalsmithing techniques. Moreover, every spectrum contained some amount of iron, uh, Fe, which you can see with all these little different blips of different sizes. Iron is, naturally occur is a naturally occurring element in most European soils, and it tends to bleed into archaeological artifacts that have been sitting in the earth for an extended period of time. Although the true provenance of the helmet is lost, we can say with a measured degree of certainty that it was constructed using pre-industrial techniques, and it was buried in the earth for an extended period of time. These initial observations also help answer uh, our second question about the object. Normally, archaeological bronzes are covered in a light green patina, uh, which is a copper carbonate. Uh, underneath this copper carbonate, a copper oxide forms called cuprite. Uh, and so you can see the cuprite, which is a brownish, sort of reddish, uh, and the copper carbonate is the light green, which everyone probably recognizes. Uh, it's all over the Statue of Liberty. Object 8-4597 was obviously cleaned at some point, and we can now see the clean bronze over much of, of the object. A hundred years ago, some conservationists would cover freshly cleaned uh, copper objects with a zinc-based chemical, or a lacquer, in order to keep it from corroding after it was cleaned. Uh, 
Uh, it is clear from our study that object 8-4597 was not chemically treated. We never detected more than just a trace amount of zinc and there were uh, no wildly unexpected elements. The cleaning actually turned out to be a huge benefit to our study because it allows us to get a more accurate measurement directly onto that shiny bronze surface. All right. To understand the production process of the helmet and all of its pieces, we determined relative com chemical compositions for each of the helmet's five parts. The right half, the left half, the patch, the rivets on the patch, and the rivets in the seam. The copper and tin contents of our results are presented in this graph. I have intentionally removed obvious outliers, except for those uh, two blue points in the lower right down here. These two are from the right side of the helmet. And actually, I should also explain that uh, the x-axis, every tick, is a 200,000 photons, whereas the y-axis, every tick, is 50,000. So the distance between here and here is, uh, oh, let's see, like from here to here, I guess, is about from there to there. It's not, or between these two. Anyway, it's complicated. The, the, <laughs> there's way, way more of the, on the y than you might be thinking there is. The right side is more damaged and less clean than the left side of the helmet, so the low tin content and relatively high copper content in these blue points down here suggests that we unintentionally measured one of the cuprite or patina patches on the right side. Without these two outliers, the right and left halves of the helmet have remarkably similar alloy typologies. Chemically, the only difference between the alloys of the two halves is that the right half had slightly more iron, less tin, and more copper, all of the elemental ingredients that we'd expect from a more corroded bronze object. Once the corrosive samples are identified and excluded from the comparison, the copper, tin, and lead contents of the two halves are practically identical. This suggests that the two halves of the helmet were constructed at the same time from the same batch of metal. The relatively high levels of tin in the patch, uh, here in gray, here, uh, suggest that it was constructed separately from the other pieces of the helmet. This, uh, this low tin reading, the, the lower one, uh, I actually think is a result of accidentally shooting cuprite corrosion, which covers one half of the patch. The cuprite, which is two parts copper and one part oxygen, causes the spectrometer to pick up more copper at the expense of the other elements in the patch, such as the tin. Knowing this, the height of this point speaks to the higher than average levels of tin in the patch. The rivets on the patch, here in yellow, uh, had lower than average levels of tin than the body of the helmet. The rivets in the seam, in green, have higher than average levels of tin. It's clear that all the measurements from the rivets fall within the larger range of values for the two halves of the helmet. Uh, but I argue that the, these divergences are still significant. First and most importantly, the segregation of the points above and below the body's average into two distinct clusters suggests that the rivets on the patch and the rivets in the seam were made at different times from different elemental recipes. Second, the rivets, both on the patch and in the seam, are less thoroughly cleaned than the body of the helmet itself. Um, and actually in this, you can see the cuprite covering half of the patch there that I was talking about earlier. The original conservators took care to define the rivets, but they did not remove much of the cuprite. We therefore should expect the device to read much higher levels of copper and lower levels of everything else. The photons from the PXRF spectrometer had to go through the entirety of the cuprite layer before they could flu fluoresce any of the tin atoms below. But in fact, the copper levels in the rivets in the patch, uh, and in the patch, uh, were, or no, in, in the patch, were lower than many of the measurements from the left and right halves of the helmet. So even though they're, they're lower than some of these. This suggests that the body of the helmet, the rivets and the seam, the rivets on the patch, and the patch were all forged at different times from different recipes. The lower levels of copper are the result <coughs> of a higher secondary element in the original mixture. The secondary element uh, was lead. As this graph shows, there was a notable amount of lead in every one of our measurements. On average, the rivets in the seam and on the patch had higher amounts of lead than the body of the helmet, and the patch itself had uh, really huge amounts of lead, which is way, way up here. Uh, okay. Again, these characteristics support the conclusion that the patch, the rivets, and the helmet body each had different production origins. Uh, but why lead, and why is there so much of it? Why use different recipes for different parts of a single object? And is this event uh, even intentional, or is it just a consequence of pre-industrial metalsmithing techniques? I think it's fair to assume that ancient metalsmiths intentionally used different elemental recipes for different object typologies. I've already argued this point in several forthcoming publications for the Ancient Greek Bronze Age, and I don't think it's too much of a stretch to extend this assumption into the Iron Age. 
In fact, I think this study directly supports that conclusion. That being said, the Greeks themselves did not distinguish between copper and bronze. They referred uh, to both with the Greek word of kalkos. Practically speaking, this kind of makes sense because most of the copper ores from Greece that we think were being used in antiquity uh, are what some archaeometallurgists have termed to be a, a dirty copper, uh, which just means that it's copper that has more than 1% arsenic. This is why we look for arsenic in our study, actually. Arsenic copper bronze actually behaves very similarly to tin copper bronze, and where I work on Crete, we actually have pure arsenic ingots, so we know that they would extract the arsenic from the copper, uh, use it for trade, and add it to forging recipes when they wanted to specifically make an arsenic copper bronze. Tin is much easier to work and stronger than arsenic, and by uh, the Iron Age, most if not all bronze objects were constructed in a uh, tin copper bronze. Tin directly increases the hardness and tensile strength of the object, uh, and in this cool graph I found, uh, so this is like how much more tensile strength than regular copper, um, these different levels of, uh, of a tin bronze. Uh, and the reduction levels are referring to how much they hit it after they made the object. Uh, and so w what I find really interesting is that the 75%, so reducing it more causes it to have less tensile strength. Um, and uh, so in th if you worked it more after the fact, if it's a more complicated object, then it's likely to have less tensile strength. Uh, the slightly higher levels of tin would have made the rivets in the seam and the patch stronger than the body of the helmet. This is exactly what you would have wanted for these object typologies. The rivets need, needed to keep the helmet together and the patch needed to protect the brake. Lead has a relatively low melting point and it is very heavy. On the microscopic level, however, lead crystals do not actually mix very well with copper and tin crystals. Uh, and actually, this is a close-up of, uh, of a copper alloy and all these little gray blobs are the tin, that, or the lead that hasn't uh, gone into the object really, it just kind of just stay there. This means that lead makes metal uh, much easier to pour and denser, but much more brittle. Lead was probably added to the recipes of the rivets for its forging benefits and, and to the patch for its added density. The high amount of lead in the patch would have made it heavier and a duller grayish color than the rest of the helmet, um, similar to some of these weights, or these lead weights in color. Uh, it probably felt great having a heavier and colorfully distinguished patch over the brake on your helmet, but it was actually more susceptible to shattering from blunt force than the rest of the helmet, because none of that lead really seeped into the, into the micro uh, structures. From an archaeological perspective, the fact that each piece of the helmet had a different production history is actually rather remarkable. It suggests that a lot more work went into the object than we might have expected. If an ancient metalsmith knew he needed to rivet the two halves of his helmet together, why not make the rivets at the same time as the body of the helmet? Similarly, if he knew that he was uh, going to rivet a patch over a break, why didn't he make the rivets and the patch all at once from the same or a slightly altered recipe? The results suggest that the rivets were constructed much earlier in bulk to be used in any or all situations that they might be applicable. Ancient Greek metalsmiths probably forged a whole bunch of, whole bunch of generic rivets all at once and then kept them around the workshop for future projects. I, I come from a family of mechanics, and my father always had a box of screws, a roll of duct tape, and a rubber band ball close at hand whenever he worked in his workshop. And I think that the ancient metalsmiths probably had the same sort of idea. The dissimilarity of the rivets on the patch and the rivets in the seam suggests that either the helmet was repaired in a different workshop from where it was constructed, or that it was repaired much later after the metalsmith had exhausted and replenished his box of generic rivets. Object 8-4597 was probably forged in five steps. Forge one half, one half of the helmet, then forge the other half of the helmet. Pick out the rivets that you need from a box of pre-made rivets. Rivet the two halves together, and then finish the object. This process must have been pretty time-consuming and laborious, but it didn't requ require a huge amount of metalworking skill on the part of the metalsmith. Later Corinthian helmets were always forged from a single piece of bronze without any rivets. They were constructed in three steps, forge the helmet, shape it, and finish it. They required less time and less labor than their uh, two-piece predecessors, but much more skill. I say predecessor, but we don't actually have a hard date for object 8-4597, and there is only one other two-piece Corinthian helmet from ancient Greece. Um, this helmet is pretty poorly preserved, and it was discovered at the back of the museum storeroom at ancient Olympia, uh, without a label and without a known find spot. 
the chronology of the Corinthian helmet is actually a huge problem for ancient scholars. The oldest one-piece Corinthian helmet, the helmet in this slide, uh, was discovered in a pit at Olympia. Lying next to it um, was, uh, was this uh, decorated amphoriscos, which you see on the left, and, uh, <coughs> sorry, and this much simpler helmet um, on the right. The amphoriscos probably dates to around 700 BCE. The conical-shaped helmet, uh, officially of the Kegel helm typology, uh, is the oldest helmet type of the Greek Iron Age. So altogether, these three objects were dated to the end of the 8th century, based on these relationships. Most Kegel helm helmets, uh, like this one found in Argos, probably date to the last quarter of the 8th century BCE. <coughs> its style and design is reminiscent of the late Bronze Age helmet, uh, and it fits neatly into the larger archaeometallurgical narrative for the Eastern Mediterranean. The cap of the helmet was constructed from one piece of bronze, and the cheek pieces and the neck guard were uh, riveted onto the cap. Crests were always popular helmet additions in antiquity, but they were usually constructed of wood or horsehair rather than, the, uh, rather than metal, uh, as it is here. In fact, I think this is one of the few metal crests that we have. Uh, at the same time that the Kegel helm was popular on mainland Greece, several artistic depictions of an emerging style of helmet appeared on the island of Crete in the south. And so uh, here's Crete down here. And if you're totally lost, this is mainland Greece and this is Turkey. Uh, all right. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, these images come from the bronze plate found uh, in a late 8th century Cretan tomb uh, at Cavusi, actually. Anthony Snodgrass, who wrote the first and last major catalog of ancient Greek helmets, identifies the helmets worn by the archers and the man between the two women over here uh, as vaguely early Corinthian style ish helmets based on the style of the crest the curve of the helmet at the, uh, at the back of the head, the shape of the neck, and the cheek pieces. He identifies the helmets worn by the men in the chariots as the Kegel helm typology. The line on these helmets between the cheek pieces and the cap might imply that the cheek pieces were riveted onto the cap. The cap itself is conical, uh, and the crests are very similar to the metallic crest of the, uh, the Argos Kegel helm. Although these are the best images that I could find, it seems clear to me that the artist was trying to create a distinction between the helmets worn by the archers and the helmets worn by the charioted figures. The Kegel helm was an open-faced helmet, uh, while these early Cretan helmets have a relatively enclosed face. Open and, and open and enclosed faced helmets were in constant competition for most of antiquity. Unfortunately, there are no archaeological examples of this 8th century Cretan helmet that we see in these images. What does emerge from Crete by the middle and the end of the 7th century BCE is a whole series of beautifully decorated helmets with repose and incision. Uh, these helmets do not have complete nose guards, uh, and many of them are, uh, have fitted cheek pieces which conform to the shape of the mouth. So this little, right around where your mouth would be. This design feature was way before its time in the 7th century and wouldn't be seen on the mainland until the beginning of the 5th century BCE, about 100 years later. These Cretan helmets, like objects 8-4597, were constructed from two pieces of bronze and riveted together vertically below the crest of the helmet. Uh, and you can see the line where the rivets, uh, where the two pieces would have met right there. And it goes underneath. This is a visor that's attached. It's impossible to know whether the earlier Cretan helmets were constructed from one or two pieces because they're only ever attested in art, and these characters are only ever shown in profile. I think it's fair to assume that, uh, that they were two-piece helmets because of the later traditions. Two-piece helmets required more time, money, and labor than one-piece helmets. And if they had the technology for one-piece helmets in the 8th century, then they should have had it in the 7th. Uh, but they clearly don't. So it follows that the helmets in the 8th century images must have been two-piece helmets. This narrative gives the Cretan helmet typology a very logical progression from 8th century through to the end of the 7th century BCE. As metalsmiths constructed, constructed this helmet type again and again, it took on a more sophisticated design and developed into an object for artistic expression and aristocratic display. On the mainland, the narrative is much more complicated. The current narrative says that the open-faced Kegel, uh, Kegel helm developed into the Illyrian style. The early Illyrian style of helmet started to appear at the very beginning of the 7th century BCE. The uh, eastern S cone was removed from the top of the helmet, but the harsh vertical cheek pieces remained. Instead of riveting the cheek pieces onto the cap, Illyrian helmets borrowed from the Cretan style and were formed from two pieces of bronze riveted vertically along the crest. Uh, and actually, this 
image of an early uh, Illyrian is only half of a helmet. We lost the other half, and so we just have the, the holes where the rivets would have gone. Although they borrowed Cretan uh, metalsmithing techniques, Illyrian helmets remained open-faced, like the Kegel helm type. Later Illyrian helmets, like the later Corinthian helmets, were constructed out of a single sheet of bronze. For the Corinthian helmet, this is the current narrative down here. Uh, while the am I blocking that one? Uh, while the Kegel helm was developing into the two-piece Illyrian helmet and eventually the one-piece version, the one-piece Corinthian helmet appeared just after the introduction of the Kegel helm at the end of the 8th century. More traditionalist scholars uh, have li liked to point to, the, to this archaeometallurgical narrative to praise the brilliance of Greek craftsmen. The complicated one-piece Corinthian helmet seemed to s basically spawn from nothing. This narrative doesn't really sit right with me. You can probably imagine. And it was constructed uh, and to accommodate this extremely early one-piece helmet found at Olympia. Several scholars, including Anthony Snodgrass, have voiced their concern over the date of this object. These three objects were found in a pit at Olympia, one of the most important religious centers uh, of ancient Greece. These objects uh, are not related to any one architectural feature, so the objects might, uh, might not be in their original contexts uh, and may not actually relate to one another chronologically. A priest might have simply pushed these objects aside to make room for new dedications. They were not particularly flashy or decorative, and there is some debate as to whether the Amphoriskos and the Kegelhelm are even contemporary. Uh, and I would probably argue that they're not. In reality, uh, this deposit might represent three separate dedications made over a period of 100 years. For these reasons, I do not think that this iteration of the Corinthian helmet uh, belongs at the end of the 8th, eighth century, and instead we should place it towards the end of the 7th century around the time when, the Greek, when Greek metalsmiths started to experiment with the one-piece Illyrian helmet design. If we ignore this seemingly misplaced Corinthian helmet, there remains an important uh, gap in the development of the Corinthian style. Object 8-4597 might be the missing link between the earliest styles of Greek helmets and the later Corinthian helmets. If we accept this progression for the Cretan helmets from a rudimentary enclosed style to a complex a uh, style that addresses specific, the specific needs of the wearer, then maybe this is an alternative reconstruction for the development of the Corinthian helmet. And object 8-4597 is our missing link, a proto-Corinthian helmet. On the mainland, uh, uh, the Kegel helm was the dominant helmet typology of the 8th century BCE. This helps to explain the images of men in Cretan helmets fighting men in Kegel helmets, Kegel helm helmets, because it means that these two helmet types were the only helmet typologies in the Greek world during the 8th century. Sometime around 700 BCE, uh, Greek metalsmiths began to tweak the Kegel helm design. Borrowing from Cretan metalsmithing techniques, one group of metalsmiths produced a new and improved open-faced typology, which became the Illyrian style. This has uh, always been the narrative for the Illyrian style, but what I'm suggesting is that another group of mainland metalsmiths adopted both Cretan metalsmithing techniques and the enclosed Cretan helmet style in order to create the Proto-Corinthian helmet. This interpretation makes object 8-4597 a rough contemporary to the earliest Illyrian styles, meaning that it was probably constructed in the first quarter of the 7th century BCE. As ancient metalsmithing techniques became more sophisticated, mainland metalsmiths figured out how to create their new Illyrian and Corinthian typologies from a single sheet of bronze. Unlike the Cretans, Mainland Greeks were able to work from the metallurgical traditions and memories of the Kegel helm. In a way, the Corinthian helmet is a hybridization of mainland and Cretan metalsmithing ideas of the late 8th century. It was the enclosed face alternative to the open faced Illyrian helmet. Although Snodgrass did not know about Object 8 4597, he did know about the two-piece Corinthian helmet from Olympia, the one that uh, was found in the back of a storeroom. He suggested that it might actually have been one of the helmets depicted in uh, these 8th century Cretan bronzes. If he's right, it would make the Hearst helmet even older than what I proposed, a contemporary of the Kegel helm in the 8th century. But again, I don't think that's right. First off, the Cretan helmets don't have nose guards, uh, and it doesn't make sense to me that they would suddenly abandon these if they existed in earlier versions of the helmet. Uh, it also brings back, this, this proposal also brings back to the forefront the issues I took with the traditional narrative for Corinthian helmets. It seems unlikely to me that this relatively complex design uh, simply spawned out of nothing, whereas the Kegel helm has clear Near Eastern origins. Uh, 
To sum up, this study offers two important conclusions about ancient Greek metalsmithing and ancient Greek military technology. First, the chemical diversity of the helmet's body, its rivets, its patch, uh, and its patch suggests that every piece was forged at different times from different recipes. This means that metalsmiths probably kept a large number of pre-made rivets around their workshops, which they could use in any of their projects. This in turn speaks to the relative sophistication of the metalsmiths themselves and gives ancient rivets a sort of one-size-fits-all quality. Rivets were used in many different objects of varying shapes and sizes, from large vessels to small knives. A metalsmith probably had to keep a range of rivets close at hand. Further PXRF work needs to be done with rivets specifically to better understand how this really worked. The second conclusion uh, re rewrites the narrative of ancient Greek defensive technology. The single piece Corinthian helmet did not miraculously spawn from nothing, but instead represents the confluence of mainland and Cretan metallurgical traditions. It achieved the cranial strength of the Kegel helm, but the facial protection of the Cretan helmet. The Proto-Corinthian helmet was an important first step as early seventh century metalsmiths struggled to achieve this balance. This historical interpretation fits neatly into the processualist reading of Greek archeology, span the one that Anthony Snodgrass came up with and promotes, but uh, it relies on a pretty shaky evidence, admittedly. I expect that our understanding of ancient military technology will continue to change as classical archeologists publish new objects and use new technologies to challenge entrenched narratives. We will never know for certain where or when object 8-4597 was actually excavated, but that doesn't preclude it from helping us understand ancient Greek military technology and ancient Greek metalsmithing. Thank you. Jesse, uh, we have just, uh, a few minutes for questions. Back to your chart of types of strength and protection. Yeah. Do, 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 do. And so this is related to, you, you were saying this was related to rivets. Uh, well, I was thinking that, yeah, well, it's related to anything. It's any, this is a study they did on um, just any tin, copper, bronze. Uh, and they, the way that they did, they, they measured it very scientifically, the way they did reduction, because they, they had little samples, and then they were physically measured uh, and everything else. Sure. So, you know, early on you were talking about some inconsistencies, um, potentially within the fabric of, say, one of the halves. Yeah. And I'm curious about you know, standardization in these kinds of metallurgical practices. And specifically, could, what do you think is going on when you have a, across one, say, hemisphere of a helmet chemical consistencies that may have had something to do with thermal regulation during mm. the process or what ores they were using, what fuels they were firing with, yeah. because in a reduction atmosphere and you're going to have to fill yeah. the fuels that you're firing with. So, I mean, just what's your take on what was going on with those inconsistencies as opposed to somebody working with maybe more standardized range yeah. or rivets that come from, you know, a particular type of technique? This is generally my problem with all metallurgic, archaeometallurgical studies right now because, like, we use things like this all the time where we look at what people have done in a closed setting but uh, it was way more chaotic. One of the things that I, uh, it was completely random and it's really hard to really know how they were doing it. Uh, and actually, I, I did a lot of work with ingots, with bronze ingots. And one of my favorite things about ingots is that um, you can always, if you look at a microstructure on the inside, the, uh, the part that was touching the mold is a completely different shape than the part that was open to the air because just because the difference in temperature between the mold and would have completely changed how the metal formed. So uh, yeah, it's just chaos and a mess. So I don't really know. But um, I do think that the, the fact that there, the two halves are related suggests that they, were, that they were under the same conditions when they were made. Um, and the fact that the other pieces are slightly different to me suggests that they must not have been in similar conditions. But there is the possibility that he could have just waited a day and then made the rivets or something like that. So. <laughs> or, or even just that they, like you're saying, maybe if somebody else, maybe somebody else is making the rivets. Yeah. Or right? knowing that down the road they can use different techniques to reform those little guys yeah. as opposed to the 
Yeah. I'm very interested in the sequence of operations in which people might have organized their labor and their materials, right? Yeah, of course. It's, it's interesting to think about, okay, somebody mentally mapping out how much tensile strength they're going to get if they don't overly reduce something. That's, you know, that's, yeah. that's interesting, right? Because then you're thinking about different batch processing, perhaps different hands in the process. So, you know, My general theory is that it was all done by color. Uh, rather, th uh, rather than anything else. And I think that they cared more about the color than the actual properties that the metal provided. So we, in, on, on Crete, we have a whole bunch of arsenic, really heavy arsenic bronzes that would have, because arsenic starts to evaporate before the, the, bron the copper forms. So it's all on the surface. So if you would have touched these things for a really long amount of time, you probably would have started to poison yourself. Uh, but they, they really liked it for jewelry, and my theory is because it looks very similar to silver, and they were trying to copy the look of silver. So uh, I think that they cared more about sort of what it looked like, especially with these things, which everyone always likes to look at helmets and say, oh, they're practical defense, but this is only about a millimeter thick, and it's copper against iron. It's not going to do much. It might just be more important to think about how brittle they're making the metal. And you get a yeah. reputation for a helmet that cracks when it gets packed the wrong way in a trunk. Yeah, exactly. You know, fewer people buy your helmets because your stuff is really fragile. <laughs> yeah, and actually the, the, the later Corinthian helmet that I showed has the same break over the eye. Uh, and so I, when I came into this, I was wondering if maybe it was a manufacturing error or something like that, but uh, the, because everything is so random. I mean, maybe they just had a whole bunch of pre-made patches too or something like that, and they just made it and then did it, but who knows, so. Yeah. Um, taking into account the Hirsch helmet that you looked at and given the millimeter, millimeter and a half thickness and given the design which clearly limits the ability to see here and shout out, mm. why would one want to wear one of these in that? It doesn't seem you're getting much, if anything. Yeah. Um, it could be psychological. Uh, there's someone, I think actually you mentioned the tin hats of World War I and uh, things like that. Uh, right. That sort of like, it feels good to have something metallic and shiny on your head if you're going into <laughs> battle. Um, I think also, I think that these things were not necessarily always worn in battle, uh, and that these sorts of helmets and things like this were the kind of things that you would uh, put up on display or uh, just wear around the city in order to show off that you're oh, the soldier and everything else. Um, because, in, I mean, then again, it, it could also be, there's an, another theory that the guys who were wearing this were just kind of standing there not doing anything. So they didn't really need, they were more, uh, they didn't need to communicate, they didn't need to really do anything except stand there and take missile weapons, so. Well, in literature we do have statements made that they were worn. I'm yeah. not sure if they're worn by everyone. And they're always, they're always worn in, in base painting. Uh, right, well that's... Yeah, so. Yeah, I, I can understand why some people may not want to have worn them at all. What I would like to do in the future is get a, um, get a standard of these elemental types so that I could use an algorithm like the, the one, kind of the one that Bruker has, in order to figure out the exact chemical composition. And once I have the exact chemical composition, then I can test it in the, uh, in the kind of the ways that you would test a bicycle helmet and actually figure out if, if, I, if, if, you know, if the guy fell over even, if it would cause brain damage. Right. So, uh, or it would just, you yeah. know. So that's what I'd like to do in the future, but that, that requires more time and money. Andy. Yeah, several points. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, first of all, in reference to Jim's question, James's question, uh, has anybody ever suggested that the switch from open face to closed face um, paralleled or was occasioned by the switch from basically sword fighting to um, thrusting spear hmm. fighting, where you aim at the neck and eyes and mouth of the opponent? No, I haven't. That's an interesting, very interesting idea, actually. But no, I haven't heard that. One of the things I've been struggling <laughs> with is the idea that they would carry swords at all because, uh, because it, they always carry them loosely and require two hands. Yeah. So I don't know what they're doing, how they're, maybe they're cupping it in there or something. Well, for what it's worth, as you know, the Fiji bars, mm -hmm. um, famously, the, the two phalanxes do not carry swords. Yeah, exactly. And everybody, everybody's kind of worried about that <laughs> because they, later on, Later representations, they do, but yeah. who knows whether that's... And they're all wearing enclosed-faced helmets on that, on that too. Helmets, yeah. exactly. Interesting. So one wonders whether the old, um, huh. the, the $60,000 question about hot light phalanx <laughs> yeah. might be lurking around here somewhere. Yeah. Um, secondly, of the tens of thousands of bronzes discovered in Olympia, 
almost none were found in primary contexts. Yeah. They're almost all uh, in the fills. Uh, it's clear that they result from multiple cleansings of the sanctuary. Yeah, okay. Uh, and so, in other words, your point about the um, discovery of the Olympia helmet together with that uh, early Proto Corinthian alabaster, yeah. uh, alabaster from Amphoriscos, I couldn't figure out which it was. Yeah. Um, it's labeled as an Amphoriscos. It's certainly early Proto Corinthian, so it's about seven. In fact, there's no incision, so it's probably even earlier than 700. Okay. I'd say 725, 700. Okay. 700. Um, the, that, that, that could be quite accidental. I yeah. Know you, you, in any pit or any fill, the latest element dates it, but yeah. then you get the circular argument, what's the latest element? Exactly. Yeah. So I have no problem at all with you messing around right. with the date of that. Yeah. Um, and uh, was there anything else? Um, oh yeah, um, so did you actually arrive at any uh, conclusion about the dents and cracks and so on? I mean, no. I've been thinking about this. Yeah. Uh, so okay. So uh, when I was growing up, I was playing. I played the saxophone in school and everything else. And at one point, I remember I was sitting, uh, and I dropped it onto my music stand, the little, little leg of my music stand, and I, it, it completely folded in half, just a really small distance. Uh, and so uh, I, I've been thinking about this all, as I've been going through this project and trying to come to an answer about these dents. But I think at this point, I, you know, it could have just been the way the guy put it into a pit, uh, and it could have caused that dent. I, you know, the copper can it can be surprisingly malleable. Uh, yeah, I mean, the thing about any kind of helmet like that, that's a little, one to two millimeters um, thing, yeah. is that it would be okay at repelling a, a cutting blow. Yeah. Particularly if you had a thick leather or Wool well, that, yeah, that's the padding inside yeah. it, and we know that they did wear them because actually we have you know, the gravestones where they mm -hmm. have the padding. But it would be very bad at repelling a penetrating, yeah. um, like, like a spear. So one does wonder, in fact, whether by the time that they have introduced the thrusting spear, yeah. whether in fact that the bronze part of the helmet is essentially cosmetic. I don't know if anyone's done any dating on the on the, the thrusting spear tips, and I'd be interested. I know that there was a recent book that got a lot of heat because it wasn't very scientific by yeah. Chris Matthews or Christopher Matthews. But well, we got thousands of them, so yeah. Sure to, so. Uh, so one of the things I've been thinking about on on their on their shields, which we know, I mean, their shields, and they must have worked pretty well. Yeah. Occasionally, they have bronze decoration on the front. Yeah, but that's, that's only decoration. Yeah. I mean, the shield itself must have been wicker or wood. Exactly. So I'm wondering if it's the same thing for the helmets. And the bronze is just more yeah, of like a they're, covering. They're less than a millimeter. Oh, are they? Okay. Yeah, those, mm. um, the shield, uh, shield facings, as we yeah. call them at Olympia, are they're so thin they're like sheet paper. Yeah. Okay. So these are a little bit, a little bit thicker, but not, not by much. Any, any other? Did you have a question? There's a helmet, perhaps in New York, that has a name on it. Are you yeah. Pericles. How does that relate to the one that is? Uh, yeah, so, well actually the one, the Cretan helmet is, that might be the one you're thinking of at the Met. Uh, let's see, uh, it's signed, it says like Nearchos Amy. Yeah, oh I did, uh oh. Well, is that gonna work? Anyway, the, the Cretan helmet, the, the one that's two rivets, uh, that's riveted together. Uh, has uh, an inscription on it, and a lot of them do have inscriptions. Um, most of these objects were found in religious contexts, um, so they were probably dedicated, um, dedications that people made. Uh, I mean, to get into, oh, okay. <laughs> there it is. So it actually says right here, you can kind of make it out. Uh, but it says, I am, I am of someone, basically, and with a proper name. Um, so anyway, anyway, a lot of these were probably inscribed after they were dedicated, whereas they were probably not inscribed during production or anything else. Um, though actually, they could have been, now I think about it, but there's no, nothing that we could say about that. So, um, few of them actually sit right out, like, I am a dedication for someone. They mostly just say, I am of someone, or uh, this belongs to someone, or something like that. So, anyways. Any other questions? I was wondering if uh, anyone any other studies have been done of these helmets, perhaps using a destructive method like ICPMS, nope. or more accurate? 
I would love to do one of those, but no. Yeah. <laughs> Um. <laughs> exactly. Maybe inside the rim where you wouldn't see the <laughs> Right. Yeah, maybe a little. Uh, That's really what's needed for more accurate measurements, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. We would need to do, I mean, I would love to cut one of these open and look at the microstructures, just, just at that, because we would be able to tell, you know, we'd get a rough ex estimation of how many times the guy hit it while he was forging it, um, that kind of thing, because they didn't have squelching technology or anything like that yet, so. But, um, no, none of, that, none of that stuff would ever happen, I don't think, uh, the, just based on the legality of uh, ob archaeological objects, specifically in Greece and Italy. So, uh, yeah, where I work on, on site, you can't, you can't even really clean them. So uh, sometimes I've done, had to do XRF studies on corrosion. And it's just like, okay, there's a ton of copper, great. So, but that's just the way that the system works over there. So. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you.